what's going on everybody and welcome to the 89th episode of the hot takes podcast we got a very special episode for you guys as always as we are once again doing another spotlight interview we got a great guest on here today he is my cousin but not only that he's an actor director writer musician he basically does all of it in the industry so let me introduce you to him Kent Moran, thank you for being here, my man. What's up, guys? Thanks <laughs> for that very nice introduction. Oh, of course, man. You deserve yeah. it. You literally do all, do it all, you know? Well, thank you, man. But I mean, like I say to most people, it's just like a matter of, as you know, like wearing a lot of hats out of necessity is how it started. So, Yes, right. But uh, but it's fun. I, I fell in love with a lot of different ways to create stuff. So it's, it's nice. I think it's all about expressing yourself in some form or the other. And it doesn't have to be art necessarily all the time either. Absolutely. Just expressing yourself in any sort of way to make you happy. You yeah. know, that's what matters. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, man. I mean, like I would be doing it no matter what, you know, like just, just for fun, for motivation. It's what I love. So right. it's great. Yeah. Exactly. Just like you, you're doing this and exactly all like, the stuff you do. It, I have my main job and everything like that, but, you know, this is my hobby. This is what I like to do for fun. Absolutely. You know, it's the editing portion of it. It's talking to great people like yourself and others and whatnot during podcasts. So it's awesome like that. Yeah, man. Um, So I wanted to get right into it with you. uh, But I want to start, like, from the very beginning with your whole creative process and what you first started to do and everything like that. So my first question for you really is... What made you decide that filmmaking and music was what you wanted to do for a living? Uh, that's a hard question because I've always known since I was a kid, really, it was started with acting. And, uh, you know, you probably know my mom was taking us to movies since I was six months old, literally. And I can't even remember a time when we weren't going to the movies all the time. Mm. So I've seen like everything. And I just it, I was always inspired by film. Um, musicals as well like theater and stuff but it's really been film and I just have always wanted to do it so you know going to school I was doing some plays um, and things like that growing up but it wasn't until after college that I decided this is what I want to do with my life and right and that's when I made the move into New York and and just sort of started without knowing anything about the industry and uh, and it worked out it's been a great ride so far it's for sure awesome. you kind of yeah. just like jumped right in sort of deal yeah because I was like it's now or never is what I thought in my head. And I was just like, I I had this like crazy time frame. Like I was like, if I'm not going to do what I sort of went to school to do and like was planning to do with my life. Um, it was just this turning point that I was just like, I got to do what's right for me. And that's what I felt in my heart. And so I just went, went for it with, like I said, without knowing much, um, not like I hadn't acted before, but the industry, the professional industry is definitely a lot different than just like doing plays and things. Oh, for sure. So that first year was like a really big learning curve, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Now, like you said, following your heart, listening to your heart, <laughs> yeah, basically, right. I wanted to <laughs> add that in there real quick. <laughs> um, no pun intended. Yeah, no pun intended, right. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, later on as well. Um, so you moved to New York. Well, first off, when you went to school, you didn't study in like communications or anything like that? What did you so, originally study for? Yeah, I studied for finance, but I had a minor in like uh, – music and, and and not a minor but concentration in music and acting so i did do acting classes and and music and music business classes but truthfully my major was was finance and that's what i thought i was going to do right yeah i feel like it was something that was just always in the back of your mind it's like no i'm, I'm gonna go with the with the filmmaking music route for sure i feel like yeah. that was it with you right yeah and the filmmaking didn't even come up till till listen to your heart like i didn't think anything about filmmaking uh, it's just crazy because to me, I'm almost more passionate about it now than acting, like pretty tied. But uh, but it's not something I envision myself doing growing up or even after college. Um, but as a struggling actor trying to get something made, just by nature, I started writing my own content. And um, one of those became Listen to Your Heart. So Now, when it came to like your first uh, piece of content that you released into the world, right? Like professionally done like you put your soul and heart into it and everything Mm -hmm. was that uh, a film a short or was it music that you started releasing first uh i mean i started releasing music first um even in high school and stuff like that on on a small scale but professionally i would say it was it was really i mean if you're talking acting i did a few acting roles during that first year Um, in like some soap operas and and commercials and things like that but listen to your heart was my first like lead role in a feature um, that got you know professionally distributed and all that so that really I feel like was my first big break into the industry right 
I remember back in the day, you gave us the CD for <laughs> Camo, oh, yeah. and I remember loving it. Oh, I, I remember loving it. I was like, this oh, is awesome. You. Like, <laughs> uh, how, how is he doing this and everything like that? Wow, Just like man, the, 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 the tracks that you had on and everything. Like, I'm a big fan of like EDM now and like right. pop and everything like that. And that's what that was all about. So it's yeah. like, oh my God, like. I want to start doing this too and everything. Oh, thank you. Man. I will say you were a very big inspiration as far as making because I'll make my silly songs and everything like that. Oh no, they're great, dude. I love them. <laughs> no, seriously, good thank stuff. you. Um, but always in the back of my mind, it's like, all right, is this how is this how he would do it? Like, maybe let's try this way instead. Oh, I'm that's like awesome, trying to think man. in my head. Yeah. See, I look at at, at the whole camo thing as like a just like a big learning curve into like what I want to do. I was still figuring everything out, so I was just experimenting with a lot of stuff. And yeah. And uh, but it's really cool. Maybe you were too young <laughs> that you liked it so much. But maybe because uh, I look at it as like I, I just it's not what I would choose to do today. But as an artist, you just got to keep throwing yourself out there, do creating. Really, I'm a big believer now more than ever. Like just keep creating. Um, I'm not. I'm kind of a perfectionist, so I fight against that. But I don't. I think that can get in the way of of doing and creating and stuff. So I think learn on the way. I mean, obviously you want to do the best you can and make the best stuff that you can. But um, but that's gonna happen faster and better if you just keep creating content. So that's Absolutely. how I feel. Practice makes perfect in a sense. Yeah. And I also think when you release stuff, like like you said, make it the best as it can be. Sure. Release it, and it's always great to get feedback. Like yes. You can't. It can't always be just your opinion on stuff like that. You know what I mean? That's so, another big lesson. Like now, before I release it, you know, you don't want to like. I used to release stuff and then ask for feedback. Now I ask for feedback. I go through revisions, you know, to an audience that doesn't know me. You know what I mean? Like I have like focus groups and things like that, that, uh, that I'll sometimes do for movies before we release them. Gotcha. Yeah. That's interesting. Now you just grab random people that or like hire people to like do stuff like that. Listen and watch your stuff. We don't hire them. We basically do like a free screening, uh, you know, when it's really close, uh, actually different times One we'll do like an edit screening when the edit is locked, but nothing else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll tell them going in like sound, sound design, color correction is not finished, etc. Um, and then we'll get notes there and then we'll finish up the edit and then, um, uh, and then we'll do another one like right before release. But I think it's really, you gotta be careful how you use those focus groups and those test screenings because just as research, like I said, I'm a perfectionist. So I actually researched, I went to a bunch of uh, focus groups and test screenings for really big directors like Michael Mann and, and mm. a few other uh, you know ones during their movies. And I would go to five or six of them and watch them over and over again as the cut progressed and see how, how they made the changes. Oh. And a lot of times, probably, I've probably done it six times and, and literally half of those times I feel like they kind of ruined the movie um, they had like a cut that was amazing along the way it wasn't the first cut almost never is the first cut mm -hmm. but like along the way they listened to some feedback and they did their own thing and they they molded into something great but then there's a point where you can start listening to the audience too much and you're trying to please too many people and you're not following what your goal for the movie was or whatever and sometimes it can get lost so I saw a few movies go downhill that way so you just got to be careful with listening too much to other people and really just staying true to what you want to do with the project. For sure. I think that's the most important with it uh, anyway, is yeah. staying true and, and listening to what, listening to your vision basically in mm -hmm. a sense. Um, and the other thing you also have to look out to for is like when, when it comes to big studios, the studio itself could mangle with your project too. I, I've seen that happen with a couple of big blockbuster movies like uh, DC projects and whatnot. Where Absolutely. the studio itself mangled the director and writer's vision and whatnot. Happens all the time. And these projects I was telling you about were studio films. And so <clears throat> you got to wonder, was it the director that was making those decisions? Or was it the studio really listening to the feedback that they're getting from audience members? Which I totally get. Don't get me wrong. I get it. I do it myself. I want to get that feedback. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's a creative, subjective art form. And so you got to... You got to be true to, like I said, you know, what, whatever you're trying to say with the movie. And I do think the director should have the final say in almost all cases. I agree. Yeah. Um, but un unfortunately, it's not the case. But, you know, the studio is putting up all the money. So exactly. They, they have to have the say in, in most cases. Definitely. And what you brought up before is that film, even music, too. It's all subjective. Everyone has their opinions on it. I actually find that a beautiful thing yes. about it. I think that's the best part of it, to be honest with yep. you. You know, you, you could have a fantastic movie and you just got to know that not everyone's going to like it. Not everyone's the same person. I think there has to be an acceptance of that 
uh, for sure. But you just knowing in the back of your mind, this was my vision. Like, I'm glad how this turned out. And, uh, you know, the, the films that you have made so far, plenty of people have loved uh, the turnout of them. So, right. you know, uh, yeah. I think it worked out in your favor. Oh, thank you. But, yeah, you're so right. I mean, you can read reviews, even in my films, too, and I'll be like, you know, you can really get down on yourself. But it's really not about that. And I look at a lot of filmmakers that I respect and love and I love their movies. <laughs> no one makes a perfect movie. You know, it's 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 impossible. And, and sometimes what a critic is going to say um, it could tear apart what I think is a really great movie or vice versa. It could be a movie I don't like or don't think is very good, but the critics will praise it. So again, you can't seek uh, acceptance outside of, of yourself, like you just said, and, and, and what is, is right for what you were trying to do. So uh, the truer you stay because of the subjective medium, the truer you stay to what, what you want to do, the best it's going to come out, the better it's going to come out. And I think that's true for everyone. And I think the cool thing, like you said about subjective uh, medium here with with music movies everything is that you can make a niche you can make like uh, a following for what you do you know if you try to be like somebody else it's just not real it's just not going to get the same sort of attention you could be someone that a lot of people just hate what you do yeah <laughs> but like a lot of people might absolutely love it and just stick with with those fans stick with you know Stick with you. Do you. That's what I got to say with that. Yeah, definitely. It It's boring when you're trying to, for, probably for yourself too, but for other people watching you, to copy someone else because it's something they've already seen before. Yeah. And um, even if you do copy someone and you do get some, some sort of traction from it, it's most likely not going to last, in right. my opinion. you right. got to have your own ideas and everything like that for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like the one-hit wonder sort of scenario, you know, where they're trying to do what's ever popular right now and then it doesn't catch on but if you do i was just talking to katrina about this um if you do something that's true to you but you're like oh i don't see anything out there like this right now i don't know if people are going to accept it it's probably the best thing you could do because when people do something new and fresh all of a sudden after that gets released everyone else is like oh yeah you know i should do that or now they'll be copying you and then in like five years there'll be five things like that but you were the first one to do it and i think that's what causes the attention because it's so real and it's so organic and so i try to hold on to like any organic creative thought that we have like because that's that's where the the dream is right there new and fresh and what you just said is the position you want to be in where others are copying you (laughs) instead of you copying others yeah yeah um unless you know there there could be a way where you just put your own spin onto something that's already been created and it could make that much of a difference too and and still work out in your favor as well i can't give you a specific example before but i could tell you it's been done before oh absolutely no i even think well look at superhero movies i mean it's essentially all the superhero movies are about superheroes but they have all these great directors and storytellers that have come into these universes and created great stories or, or retold great stories with their own creative vision of how it should be told and so it doesn't have to be the newest thing but it's your original take on it it's your organic take on it and whatever resonates with you and that's always going to turn out the best definitely definitely um i want to get into uh your music a little bit sure uh so last year in 2020 at the height of uh quarantine basically the the pandemic you released um uh press play yep and it was an ep and you had your single uh, from that uh, endless, e- endless, endlessly, right? endlessly, right, yeah. right, endlessly. Yeah. Um, now that I thought you, you saw, you noticed me promoting it on my yeah, Instagram yeah. story and everything, because truly I loved it. it. Had that EDM vibe, like I was yeah. saying before, I'm a big fan of EDM. Yeah, yeah. I felt like that was kind of different for you. It was something that you haven't done before. Right. Um, and I thought it came out great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So now. I feel like your strategy in releasing it in quarantine, I think that was a great move that you did because right. it got people's mind off off their off things and whatnot. Plus right. people weren't doing anything, you know, so like why not release now? Whatever. Right. I think for anyone that was releasing content during that time, they strived even a little bit more just because right. everyone was stuck at home and everything like that, right? Yeah, totally. So yeah. uh that wasn't your plan probably because no one knew this pandemic was <laughs> yeah. coming, right? <laughs> no, I absolutely did not plan the pandemic uh to, to hit. But uh but I was look. I had been working on that EP for quite some time, probably a year actually, uh, among my other projects. And uh, 
and I had different plans for it, of course. But but when it all happened, you know, I did think, should I wait? Should I not? And talking to the producers and other people about it, um, and we just thought, you know, everyone's online right now. You know, no one's going anywhere. But people want to hear music. People want to see content. I was like, it's actually the perfect time to create and release. And we want to feed people positive stuff and some, something that can take their mind off things, like you said. So I think it worked out as the the, the release for that. It definitely did. Now the edm like vibe to it that you had in, in right. these songs what made you decide to go that route you know uh katrina sort of got me into the more dance dance pop sort of stuff um i have always loved like like michael jackson's like my all-time favorite singer and and his kind of music i've always loved that sort of just pop and and uh the sort of funkiness to it and that that movement and and so i partnered up with the disco fries who are like a great um they do edm they do dance they're like a great dj group and um and yeah I, I i just had been a fan of their work so i wanted to work with them and so i contacted them we got in touch and i had written i wrote two of those songs myself uh press play and hold on to me and then i gave them what i had written and they sort of produced it from there okay the other ones were tracks that they had already written and i um listened to i really liked it. i basically got to listen to a bunch of their tracks and really gravitated toward those and um and then I just came up with the melodies and the stories for each of the songs. Um, but yeah, they were great to work with. And I, I just think they have that EDM sort of right now sort of vibe. And it just that song Endlessly, for example, just makes me feel like like happy and upbeat. It and is so the energy upbeat, yes. you know, of it. And so, yeah, it's just you want it to go on forever. So that's why I like sort of thought endlessly. And, and I, I made it about um, about love lasting endlessly, that kind of thing. Awesome. Now, I'll, when you're when it comes to your process of making music, like you just said, you listened to some of their tracks and then you made the the melody, you made the lyrics and everything like right, that. Right. Is that your normal uh, process of writing a song? Like, like say when we start getting into "Listen to Your Heart," you did most of the, if not all of the soundtrack for that for yeah, that film. The, yep. What comes first for you, and what works better for you? Is it the track? building first and then lyrics or do you think of lyrics first and then you start making a track afterwards it's a good question i'm sure a lot of musicians get asked this but um it's all over the place it's whatever is organic that that hits me and i'll just get hit with something and i'll have to like write it down immediately now i just use my phone i do the voice memos immediately yes so uh i can do both you know i i sort of surprise myself by doing it this way this time with listening to tracks and then writing to them I, that's more new for me but I actually loved it. It was so easy because you have this professionally produced track. It's, you know, beautiful sounding already. And then it's like, how can I elevate this? How can I make the melodies, you know, different and, and exciting for each each verse, chorus, etc. cetera. And then I really like to harmonize too. So I'll be hearing maybe harmonies or different things. And I'll just record like 20 voice memos for a song, you know? Yeah. And I'll just pick out the different parts I like the best. Uh, this is how I do it on sometimes. And then write it all out. And then with the lyrics, sometimes it'll be a lyric that happens first. You know, sometimes uh, it'll be that song endlessly. I, I sort of sang the chorus like right away in my head, and then I had to build the story around that. So, it's sort of whatever hits me first. Um, with "Listen to Your Heart" and the more stuff I'm used to doing with piano and guitar, I would literally sit down on the guitar or the piano and just play a few notes and start whatever I'm feeling at the time, right? The mood I'm in or whatever. And then like right away, it's so weird. It just happens. Like right away, I'll play like four chords or six chords or something. And, and that'll be the basis for what becomes the song. Yeah. Um, and it's really quick. That first phase of like songwriting is really quick for me. It's like just the expression of a basic idea. And then from there, it's just how crazy do you want to go with it? How much do you want to produce it? How, you know, the listen to your heart stuff was more broken down. It was more uh, just simple because it was a struggling songwriter writing, you know, the song. So uh, but the stuff I'm doing now is much more produced and uh, and thought out and things like that. Right. I like that you keep on saying the story of the song. Yeah. So is that is that something that just sticks with you every time? It's like almost a rule for you that there has to be some sort of storytelling. If the, if if that's what that's where yeah. I'm getting at. Right oh, now absolutely. With that. Yeah. yeah. I just I think if you have the opportunity to tell a story, why not? Like, yeah. I just think it makes it better and elevates it. A lot of the songs like. You know, I don't just make music. I'm a fan of music. So when I'm hearing good music, I, I always realize that the ones I like the most it doesn't have to be like a crazy story, but like they have something unique to say, or they have they're saying it in a unique way. There's some sort of meaning to it. Some sort of, of meaning day. to it. Something that sticks in your head. That's like, wow, I haven't 
thought about it like that before. It's making me think about my life. It's making me think about my relationship. Right. Whatever it is. Um, yeah, that, that, that always excites me. So I want to sort of give something people can relate to. And the way I do that is by making it as real to me as possible sometimes. Gotcha. Um, now, you said Disco Fries helped you produce uh, some, if not all, of the tracks for this latest EP? Yes. Yeah. yeah they, they did all of them. Um, so, like I said, the two that I wrote, I did like my rough version at home, sent it to them, and they and then we worked on it together to get it to where it needed to be. Gotcha. Are you familiar with, um, I don't know if, I, if you want to call it DJing necessarily, but when it comes to the track building and you're not necessarily using instruments, are you familiar and do you do some of that on your own to create tracks? Yeah, I definitely could and I have. It's just I'm so busy with everything. I just wanted to really start to figure out how can I first of all collaborate with people I respect and like their work. Yeah. And second of all, like I'm not going to be the best person at that, you know? So I want to find the best people at that and then, you know, use my experience cuz I use pro tools, I know how to build beats and all that kind of stuff. I know how to do that stuff, but I'm not at the level they are and to get a song made like they did, that would be you know, months probably for me oh, to figure that sure. out. So so uh yeah and, and like i said acting and, and filmmaking are still my main thing so this is sort of something i couldn't stop because i just love music so i wanted to figure out the best way i could do that in the time i had for sure now we, you have so many things going on right now as far as filmmaking and, and acting and whatnot uh yeah. that i feel like you might not have a lot of time to be music creating and everything <laughs> like that but i was going to yeah. ask you did you have anything in the works right now that you don't necessarily have to bring up it could be secretive what you know it could yeah, be yeah. something that's uh behind the curtains at the moment sure. um but do you have anything you're working <clears throat> on at the moment for acting or filmmaking you mean for well for music first oh for music yeah, first yeah. oh yes actually so Katrina and I have a song. I mean, this is very early to say this, but we have a song with Disco Fries that we're going to be doing together. Okay. Katrina's going to release her music first, and then we'll hopefully release this song. We haven't um, worked on it too much yet, so that's still going to take some time. And then uh, just came up with a song, I think, two days ago that I want to also record with a different producer. So, yeah, for me, it's going to be more sporadic. Like, I think I'm going to do singles, drop some singles here and there. Yeah. Um, and then when I have a little more time, maybe do another EP, that kind of thing. Yes. But uh, but Katrina, you know, is much more like that's her thing. That's her passion. You know, like mine, the forefront is acting and filmmaking. Hers is, is definitely the music. So if I'm not mistaken, what when you said releasing sporadically and whatnot, that's kind of what you did with your latest EP, right? You kind of did mm -hmm. one song at a time last last year. It was that's like every right. Friday or something like that. Every other Friday. Every yeah, other exactly, Friday. Yeah. Exactly. So I would do like a pre-release one Friday, then the next Friday, the release, then the pre-release and that kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And it was the first time I released like that and it worked out. It was pretty, uh, it seemed pretty good. Definitely. Effective, yeah. Um, so we're going to get into a little bit of uh, Listen to Your Heart now, your first uh, independent film that you written mm -hmm. um, and starred in, the main star in. Uh, the director, Matt, right? Matt, Matt Thompson. Matt yeah. Thompson, yes. You, you brought him on board to direct and everything like that. So my first question with Listen to Your Heart is what, how did the idea pop up in your head for this story that you written? Yeah, so I, I can't even tell you what – what happened but i basically went to bed one night and i had this dream or like i usually like right before i go to sleep or right when i wake up i have these thoughts and um because i can remember them <laughs> yeah i'm not dreaming and um and yeah i had just this thought of you know you know our, our uncle tommy's death right yes. and so i've always been intrigued by his life and how how he you know is and functions in the world and the different trials and tribulations he's gone through and things and then, you know, my whole songwriting background at the time that I did listen, I was doing a lot of um, a lot of songwriting. And so it just came to mind, like, what if there's a singer songwriter who falls in love with a deaf girl who can't hear the music, but she's but he's writing music for her and their relationship. And then where could that go? And so I, ha I had a dream of like the whole story the first night and I wrote it down in two days, the whole script. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I just woke up. I wrote the whole thing, probably a day and a half, honestly, and and um, and yeah, it changed a good amount since then. But it, it was like the the main story was there from from the With beginning. The concrete part of it, you, yeah, you had set in stone basically for the most part. Yeah, yeah, and awesome. that was the second script I believe I ever wrote. The first actually being the Challenger, if you can believe it. Oh, really? It was. Oh, I didn't know that. I okay. wrote that even before. Listen to your heart. A, a different version of it. Challenger's gone through a lot of versions, but uh, 
but yeah so that was the f very first thing i wrote and that i also wrote in two days it's just like once i have a script idea or back then this is how i used to do it i would just <laughs> stay up all night and just write the entire script 90 pages in in one day and it was intense but now i do it a little differently <laughs> <laughs> well i see where you're coming from by trying to do it all in one night because you want to keep every idea fresh in your head and, exactly. and knowing what's you know you don't want to lose the thought basically yeah and yeah. then i realized i don't have to be that intense about it i mean it's not gonna i, I you know you got voice memos you can talk it in some things you don't have to I think now that I've gotten more confident in my screenwriting and the structure of screenplays and all that stuff, that I uh, it, it actually is better to take a little more time. Gotcha, right? Um, so Matt Thompson, what was it your choice in bringing him on to the to film to to direct the film? Matt and I were actually about to go into production on a different film, a horror film. Oh, and that was going to be our first film, and that was when I had this dream about Listen to Your Heart. And so we pivoted and did that, but we had been friends and we had done a, like a BMW spec commercial together and mm -hmm. a few other things. And, um, so we wanted to find the project to work on. And so we sort of started together on it in the beginning. Um, and then, yeah, he, he loved the idea of, of the, the, the script and he read it and loved it. So we went with that. Awesome. Now going a little bit back to the music again with it uh i like how you said that it wasn't the the tracks and whatnot weren't like very high production because like you said the, right. the character you were playing was a struggling artist and everything like exactly, that yeah. that uh you know uh didn't have the tools or 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 what he needed basically to create high level tracks and everything like exactly, that exactly yeah um when you were creating those songs was the script already made and were you basing these songs off of certain parts of the movie it's a great it's a great question so yeah not many people have asked me that but it's it's really interesting i wrote about half of the songs were already songs i had written that i wanted to release anyway uh not necessarily in those sort of more broken down versions but mm -hmm. um when i came up with the idea i both wrote songs for the movie but mainly figured out how i could incorporate these pre-written songs into the movie and so when i was writing the actual script even that first night i was playing these songs and figuring out these songs and how can I make this and I was basically how can I tell a story through music in a script you know yeah. so it was kind of like yeah it, it, that's how I did it and and I would say once I had the characters down and figured out sort of how he talked how how she behaved and and how they interact and how this the songs could help tell the story that's when I started writing more just for the the movie right yeah. right gotcha um, I got a couple of uh, statistics here about Listen to Your Heart. Oh, boy. Uh, released in 2010, you were the writer, lead actor, songwriter, and producer for the film. So it's a lot right off the back there, uh, which is awesome. Kudos to you for that. Even more kudos to you because you got 14 wins and four nominations across the board at all these film festivals and everything, yeah. which you. is freaking awesome. <laughs> that is Thank awesome. You. So, uh, And you had Sybil Shepherd in there, uh, with, and she played a great evil mom <laughs> yeah. in, in the movie. She did a she fantastic was, job there. She was great, yeah. Yeah, and um, Alexia, I, I hope I'm saying the last name right, but Rasmussen? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, yeah. yeah. She did a fantastic job as well. She's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I was looking at her uh, IMD B uh, page and whatnot, and she she seems to be doing great uh, for herself, doing a whole bunch of different roles and everything like that. No, she, yeah. I'm proud of her. She's like right after Listen Your Heart, she just kept booking and booking and booking. She's, I mean, because she's very talented and uh, yeah. she deserves it. Yeah. Um, so as far as these 14 wins and nominations went, uh, some included Best Picture, Best Screenplay, Best Supporting Actress, and and many more of that. Yeah. Um, so how are you feeling in those moments when you First off, at these independent film festivals, are you watching the movie with all these total strangers? Yes. You are. Yes. What What is that feeling like? Is it <laughs> nerve wracking? Like how is it? How does it feel? It's always nerve wracking at the first few minutes because yeah. you. I mean, you know the movie like the back of your hand. You know exactly what's going to happen. And some audience. It's so funny. Like people think I'm crazy for watching the movie that many times, but I would watch it at every festival. And what's on it on IMDb is only probably half the festivals we actually even went to. Oh, so we went to, and you know, we toured it for over a year with just festivals and, um, you'd go into an audience and you would think they're hating it. Cause like it's silent. People are coughing. People are like moving in their chairs and some, some audiences are just quiet. Right. Yeah. And that's just the vibe in the, in that auditorium. And then at the end you get a standing ovation and you'd be like, Oh my god i thought they were hating it right. what's going on 
and then there's other movies where like they are getting every joke they're like crying they're clapping during the movie like when Sybil Shepherd gets smacked in the face they're standing and clapping and screaming I mean so it's totally different things and in those kind of situations yeah you know they're liking the movie and it's amazing yes. it's amazing to hear but it's really stressful to sit through a very silent audience I'm and sure. not know what the heck is going to happen by the end um, but thankfully uh, it was actually a blessing all, all the audiences seemed to love the movie and, and um it was so much fun just to sort of enjoy it. Every time you watch it with an audience, and you'll find this with any movie and any any person, you watch it with an audience, could be two friends, could be a thousand people, uh, whatever it is, it's a different experience for you because you're seeing it through the eyes of everyone you're with yes. as well. So it also is really helpful as a filmmaker to sort of see, well, what is resonating? What are people getting? What are they not getting? And, and what are they loving? You know, And then moving forward, you know what to do to sort of please audiences and, and make it a more enjoyable experience for people in the future. Now at these festivals, the audience, is it is it full of critics, other filmmakers? Is that usually the crowd that are at these sort of uh, um, places? Depends on the festival. Some of the festivals were, were bigger and, and actually just had a lot of like, frankly, just audience uh, fans of film yeah. that would come in to see independent film. Um, and that's, I would say, probably 60% is like that. Then you would get maybe 5% are critics, and then the rest are sort of other filmmakers and their families. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And are these are these the same people that are voting on on the films? In, only if it's audience award. So in the, we won a lot of audience awards, yes. you'll see. So a lot of the um, – all the audience awards is who's ever in the audience votes. But the rest is sort of like the judge panel. So it depends on what the judge panel is made up of on each festival. Um, and that can be just varies depend on the festival. But uh, but yeah, I always personally loved winning like audience award when we did because it just meant that it was like enjoyable for people. And that's all you really care about. Absolutely. There is a uh, certain scene in Listen to Your Heart where it's a pretty big scale scene. You have a lot of extras in it and you actually filmed it where you used to live at at at, uh, at the house yeah um so i wanted to know because i was always curious about this what was it like setting all of that up and did it even feel like your home anymore <laughs> when all these people were in there and it did it did it feel more like a set than an actual home to you oh 100 percent. like when i'm in character i just like i remember walking up that driveway and i'm like I'm going to get her back. I'm going to go up and get her back right now. You know, and I was like, and I just didn't even think of it as my, like, no way was that my house or anybody's house that I knew. It was right. just, it was, you know, Victoria and Ariana's house and that was it. So, um, yeah, so that's how it was. And it was really exciting because it did feel like a big scale production with all the extras and everything, especially at, I think it was 24 when I filmed that. Um, so that was like, that was really exciting. Wow. Wow. I'm I'm coming to the realization right now that you were 24 when you filmed that. That is <laughs> yeah. freaking awesome. <laughs> that is so sick. Yeah. Um, so that's all I had for you as far as listen to your heart. Yeah. Once again, congratulations on that film. Oh, I love that film. Um, Civil, like so you did great in it. Uh, Civil Sh uh, Shepherd did a fantastic job, like yeah. I said before too. Uh, and even your best friend, I forgot his name. Uh, the, oh like, yeah, the Frank Watson. Name. Yeah, Frank it, Watson. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's he was fantastic in it as well. Sad ending. I'm not gonna spoil anything. Go check out. Listen to your heart. Check it out. Yeah, absolutely. If you haven't said it, seen it yet, it's actually on. Uh, where is it now? Let's see. Well, YouTube, Amazon. I don't know where else anymore. It, it was on it, it Lifetime a, and stuff. Oh yeah, on Lifetime, and it had a it had a good run on Netflix for a little mm. bit too. Yeah. Oh yeah, we renewed contracts with Netflix for years. Yeah, yeah it was on there awesome. for a long time. Yeah. Hell yeah! And you just signed a deal with another uh, company that I'll bring up later yeah. too uh, yeah. for your other movie as well. That's right. Yeah. Um. So actually, oh well, the last thing I wanted to bring up about "Listen to Your Heart" was there's been talks about turning it into a Broadway play. Now, you could get into how that process has been going so far. Yeah. Obviously, things have been stopping you, but I'll let you get into that. Yeah. So the long and short of it is not to get – I don't want to get anybody excited, but it's it's sort of come to a head where because of COVID, we're not sure what's going to happen with it. Um, but at one point, um, it was in development with a theater company that has done you know some great plays and uh, with a director who's done Broadway. And um, – hired me to write and compose uh, basically a, a musical version for theater and we worked on that for over a year and it was really going well I was really liking the direction of it 
and then COVID hit and everything and and now it's really uncertain so we'll see i'm trying to find it a home but uh i hope that uh i hope that it sees the light of day i really hope so too yeah and less less question about that uh when you said you know modifying the songs necessarily for a broadway play and whatnot were were they like drastic changes to the songs there are drastic changes to everything yeah okay i mean the storyline is the same but i actually got to elevate all the songs to a different level and i'm really happy with where it is excuse me i'm really happy with where it is but um yeah i don't want to say too much but i i think i was able to make uh that leap into the musical world which i've never written a musical before Mm. so it's very different in terms of figuring out how do you translate this onto a stage all these different scenes that were on a screen right um sort of the reverse of what happens a lot of times um so not just that but then the challenge of making these sort of simple songs like we talked about before become bigger and and help tell the story and involve all the characters singing instead of just danny singing right so that has been a real joy because it's something that i think secretly i wanted to do with this movie from the beginning Mm. um so i'm i'm hoping it i'm hoping it works out and i think people would really love it if, if we're able to bring it bring it to bring theater it to bring it into theater and bring it to life in a whole another meaning sort of deal yeah yeah and i think it's where it's sort of meant to meant to be yeah definitely um i mean i think that just goes to show that it's a, a great story and it has great music music in it where mm. people could see it translate into a broadway play so yeah true. i thank yeah. you yeah no i i think it ended up being a phenomenal job um the second film that you created which this one you actually directed yourself right you were the director writer producer and once again the main star of the film Mm -hmm. uh the challenger yeah that came out in 2015 if i'm not mistaken that's right how long uh was that filming process well writing and filming process all together how long did that take you well, look, like I said, it was the first script I wrote even before Listen Your Heart. So if you count that time, it was, you know, years before we made it. Mm. But that script wasn't ready to be made. I wrote probably five scripts in between rewriting The Challenger. And um, when I knew that that movie was going to be the next one I would do, I would say from that point to shooting was maybe a year. And then the shoot, I think, was like a 24, 25 day shoot, something like that. Okay. Um Which, you know, when you say that, it's the shooting days, so you don't count weekends or whatever. Um, And then from there, I spent a lot of time on post, a lot of things. uh, I just, I was too much of a perfectionist. I edited the film myself. Uh, I had someone who helped me out in the beginning, but then, and and he did a great job, but uh, I I just really wanted to tell it a certain way. So I had my hands on the editing and there was tons of visual effects. Most of the people don't realize, but there were over 2000 visual effects in that film. Well, I'm thinking of the final fight, right? Is that where most of it was heading? A towards? lot of it, yeah, a yeah. lot of it, yep. But there were everything from, I mean, broken glass to TVs. So many TVs in the, in the movie, um, fans in the stands. Uh, my some of my boxing makeup at the at the final fight. Oh, Because sure. I'll go into how we filmed that, but we had no way in hell could we do all the makeup we needed to do in between each round. So we literally did a lot of that. Uh, fight blood and makeup in post mm. which is kind of unique for for that situation and uh just a lot of stuff so there, there were over 2000 which is honestly like the guy who did a lot of them um he did spider-man one uh and he was like this is the same amount that was in spider-man <laughs> 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 wow <laughs> so i mean if you think about it, it's ridiculous but that that's what took a lot of time too um and then of course michael's passing uh just made things a, a bit harder uh put more pressure on me but uh also made it a bit harder to pressure on the deadline because i also didn't want to disappoint fans of michaels who wanted to see his last work and everything yes. but also put pressure on me i don't want to make his last movie you know not be good so i have to make it as good as i can and and it went through a lot of uh, changes in post you know story changes and things like that so it just took time uh for those of you who don't know who michael is you definitely do i would like to inform <laughs> you it's uh michael clark duncan who uh passed away um and this was one of his last films if not the last film this right? was his very last film. this yeah. was his very last film he, which he, yeah he passed very you know pretty soon after filming with us wow how was it like uh working with him no he was he was amazing he was he was great and he became like a friend and a mentor to me um and he took a sh- took a chance on me you know i was just a kid doing an indie film and um he didn't have to do the do the movie but he gravitated to the script and 
and uh, he really gave it his all. He became an executive producer on it as well. Awesome. Yeah, so he, he was really behind it. Um, I was just so sad to lose the guy. He was yeah. such a great guy. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've seen a couple of roles that he's been in. Uh, one of them, because I'm a superhero fan, I remember him as the kingpin in Daredevil. Daredevil, sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, nowadays I look at that movie, not the best thing, but, <laughs> right. like, when I was younger, loved it. You yeah, know, I course, loved it. Yeah. So I'll always remember him uh, from that. Obviously, The Challenger as well. Green Mile. Green, and, oh, yeah, of course. And then, of course, uh, Armageddon. He was. I mean, he did a lot of great stuff. Yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. Um, so that was that was awesome that you were able to to get him on the uh, on board for the film, even as an executive producer too. How the yeah. script really spoke to him and everything like that. Yeah, no, it was a big win for us, and and once we got him, it was easier to get the other pieces into place. You know, of course. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I remember I was on set for uh, one of the days there. That's right. When you brought up the all the TVs and whatnot. How we had to pretend that something was on the screen <laughs> yeah, and right. we were all cheering and everything like that. Uh, so I see what you're saying with the whole uh, post-production thing as, exactly. as far as that and everything like that. But that was a fun day. Yeah. I, I had a lot of fun uh, that day. And I'll that tell was. you what, it was a great learning experience for me too because – you know, I didn't know how much time was spent into just like lighting, just preparing everything, yeah. providing food, all sorts of things. You know, I, I was like, wow, like this is this is how it works. It's it's wild. Yeah, it's wild. You spend a whole day sometimes and especially on bigger budget stuff and you'll just get like what's going to be 15 seconds, maybe 30 <laughs> seconds of the movie. And you're like, how did we do all this for one day? But and then maybe it gets cut, too. That's the other you know, right. crazy thing. But um. But yeah, that day was really fun, and I'm the one that edited that. So I was remembering editing you, and my dad was in that scene too. That You're able so to fun. see me in a second of the movie, so make sure oh, you check got, me he's out. He's got a close-up or two, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, we pan, yeah. pan by your face, yeah. Oh yes, yes, yes. That's yeah, right. yeah. That's see, right. I know the edit, so like you know, cause, but um, but yeah, you guys were sta- staring at little TVs with little green marks in the corners. Yes. And uh, and I was like, okay, now Jaden knocks him down. You're like, yeah, and yeah. Oh, right, now he gets knocked out, and like we're giving you all the emotions to say, you know, to 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 react to. But that was fun. What was your nickname in it again? Sneaks, and then the Bronx Boy. The Bronx Boy, yes, yeah. that's that's what I'll always remember. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, my grandpa Eddie was also in the in that's the film right. as well. You'll uh, hear him running behind me. He was. Uh, I don't know if you remember that part, but yeah, he, w- I'm running in the Bronx, and he's behind me. He's going. Jaden Miller or something he's like screaming or no he said Bronx boy and he like raises his hand in the air it's fun yeah yeah that's awesome yeah um so this film I have some stats on it as well well except I already said it was released in 2015 but that one had four wins and a nomination as well in independent uh film uh award film festivals as well yep. including audience choice award which uh you said is pretty important to to yourself and whatnot yep yeah and uh even best feature film among other ones as well that i I didn't list down so congrats on on that thank you yeah yeah i mean that one we learned a lot on listen to your heart and i think you know we could have kept going with festivals on the challenger but what we actually got into bigger festivals on the challenger but we decided to keep the run shorter and focus more on the distribution Mm. but it was it was really great because we got to go back to some of the festivals we went with listen and and to go back with the challenger was sort of like kind of being home again you know with some people that you loved and and had a great time at the festival before and it was it was it was great now with that film uh i actually don't want to say because i don't want to spoil anything i would i would love for people to watch it yeah but I'll just say originally uh, Luke was going to be a big part of the movie as well, right? Yes. Yes, okay. I just wanted to confirm that with I myself. can say yeah. that I had initially offered Luke my role, the Jaden Miller role. Oh, really? And I was going to play the competitor, ah. um, James Burchard. Um, but Luke was busy filming uh, Abu, Ghraib, Abu Ghraib, so yes. he couldn't do that. And so I ended up, strangely, like it wasn't even supposed to be me leading in the movie, and I ended up as the lead. It was but I'm, I'm happy and he's happy so it's great now here's one in like to me an important question which is what was it like directing and acting at the same time because i don't know if you knew this but ben affleck was supposed to star as batman and direct the batman movie at mm. the same time and i'm thinking to myself how the hell are you know could someone do that that's a lot of work and a lot of pressure on one, yeah. on oneself you know yeah so i want to know how you managed to do that and more importantly successfully do it yeah you know 
one friend slash word, John Michael D'Amato, <laughs> if you're watching. <laughs> no, um, he's my second unit director. And so when I would be acting, he like we went over everything. I sort of like was able to lay out my vision. I did the storyboarding. I did the shot list. Uh, and I, I sort of had him download all that in his mind and we went through all of it together. And so he was my right hand man. So anytime I was acting, he'd be directing me. And then mm. anytime I was directing and not acting, I got to direct people. So it was and of course, I'm still watching playback and doing all the other stuff a director does. But um, but that's sort of you need somebody while you're acting to help you. And that's what that's who I counted on him for that. You know, he was great. Awesome. That. Um, it's it's definitely good to find someone to you know be a right hand man in that sort of sense when you need someone. Absolutely, I mean filmmaking is such a team team thing. It's a team effort, and I feel like a lot of people um, don't realize how many people work on a film. Like mm. even the Challenger, a small film like ours, we had over a hundred people working on that film. Right, and if you include posts and stuff, probably 150, something like that. And it's just like that's a lot of people, and everyone is working toward the same goal they're they're doing different things to make the movie better and everyone's got a skill set so um so yeah even though i directed and starred in it's it means something but it doesn't mean everything at all i mean there is so many people that are helping make this movie the best it can be uh besides me so for sure um so what made you want to direct the challenger and not listen to your heart I didn't know anything about directing, doing Listen to Your Heart. In fact, that was my first time, uh, you know, producing a movie I had written or anything like that. So okay. so even the uh, the writing was intimidating to do on that film. But, uh, but then I think what happened was I just learned so much on that film. And, and then I did a few short films in between. And uh, I just fell in love with, like Luke and I took Listen to Your Heart in post-production. And really it was us that like you know shepherded that film mm -hmm. um and so that's where we that was like our film school and that's where we learned a lot about editing post-production color correction sound design and and then filmmaking in general and then so we studied both of us before i did challenger and before he did abu Ghraib. um and there's there's just something you can't get in acting when you're doing filmmaking like you you, you get you get to be the storyteller you get to like deliver a full vision of something and so something really rewarding about that definitely and i think it's crazy that you could go to school for whatever you want but it's really not until you're thrown in in the field to actually i mean sure you'll learn stuff in school but to you know really realize what you want to do and how to do it is when you're put right into the field absolutely you know? and you keep saying field and it's exactly right it's like i mean luke and i were into sports growing up a lot and it's very much like a team sport right mm. so it's like the game has started it's a train moving you can't stop the train and you know so you got to work on the fly a lot of improv a lot of figuring out problems a lot of like you know a anything you got to do to make it make it work and a lot of people working together so communication is big preparation is big all that stuff but um I forget what I was speaking about, but that's basically kind of how my philosophy is, you know. Well, yeah, definitely. Well, talking about like just being in the field, getting like jumping into it sort of oh, deal. Oh, yes. Right. What I was going to say is, yeah, a lot of my friends have said to me, they're like, I went to, you know, this film school or that film school and like spent so much money on four years. And I feel like until I worked on a film, I didn't know anything, you know, like, of course, you can learn a lot of things in theory, but it's not until you are in the game <laughs> or whatever yes. you want to say that you're like really learning how to do it and you don't have to go to film school to learn this stuff oh a hun no definitely not I, yeah. I really don't think so either and you know i think school's good for um like you were saying like the theory the theory of it and just the lingo i think the lingo in terms yes, to learn yes. i think that's what it's good for get that background out of the way sort of deal and then yeah. you <laughs> you kind of know what you're talking about when you get into the field and yeah talk, that's probably you know. the, you're, you're so right i mean that's kind of the most important thing if you're new on a set is like you might not even know what people are saying or what to do right but just knowing like what the parameters are what your job should be how the set works together how the different departments work together all that kind of stuff is probably great for film school learning but um but it's, a, it's just a different beast when you're actually making something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, the Challenger, uh, you just made a deal with Showtime to play the Challenger on most of their channels. Because Showtime yeah. has several different channels. Sure. Uh, my mom, you know, it puts on Showtime and whatnot. And flipping through those channels, some, sometimes 
Showtime's had different, different. Uh, sorry, couple of their channels yeah. playing the movie at the same time, which I think yeah, it's is crazy. awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> I think it's awesome too. <laughs> yeah, it is awesome. No, it's, um, it's really cool. So how did how did that come about? Because like I said, the movie came came out in 2015. Yeah. So all of a sudden now, you know, Showtime picked it up. What what? How did this all come about? Well, the the timing is a little strange but not that strange i'm very grateful you know to have it playing but the way a movie release you know works is that it's like a pyramid so we went to theaters went to regal cinemas first in 2015 and then it was you know then you have to wait a certain amount before you can then release it to the next stages of the pyramid Mm -hmm. so theaters is first you know it's and obviously netflix and things are changing the way this game is played but this is how it's always been theaters is first and then you got you know pay tv Right, and then you got like the HBOs and stuff like that, the Showtimes, and then you got, um, well, you also have internet somewhere in there, and then right. you also have then basic cable. So it it does go down that. So in terms of the pyramid, it came in the right place. It is a few years after, so I'm I'm uh, happy that we were able to make the deal. But uh, I've always seen it as a as a good film for Showtime. I mean, it's a boxing movie. It's got Michael Clark Duncan. It's right. got a lot of action, and it's it's heartfelt. So I feel like it's right up their alley of what they do, and. Um, and yeah, so it wasn't me that made the deal. You know, our distributor made the deal, and uh, and and that's just I'm just grateful for them to keep pushing the film, and and it worked out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like I said, I love that they're playing it all the time. I think yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah, um, it's great. And you were saying with "Listen to Your Heart," it was playing on Lifetime, right? Lifetime and Hallmark. Yeah. Lifetime and Hallmark, which I feel like that's like a perfect. Yeah. Those are two perfect channels for a movie like that to play exactly, on. Exactly. Well. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I, I think that's awesome. I just recently rewatched the the Challenger because it was on Showtime oh, nice. with the parents. Nice. So had a good time watching it, and I re- actually remember being uh, at one of your viewing parties uh, in New York in New York City. I oh, believe. Okay, cool. And we were at the theater. You you said your little speech in the beginning, your introduction, right, and right, everything right. Like I that. remember that. Yeah, yeah, and and we watched the movie. And I don't know if that was actually a final. That might have not been the that actual was an final old cut. cut. That, yeah, was, that an was an old, old cut. cut for sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so is that one of those instances where you got feedback at, on it, but you know wanted actually, to keep it true to yourself in a, in a sort? No, that was actually more for like just friends, family, and stuff like that. It was just because I don't know why the timing was for that one, but we didn't ask for feedback on that. Um, but it did change quite a bit since then. It did. Okay, gotcha. We we had a lot of visual effects and things that weren't done too. You know, at that point. Right, right. Um, so those were the two independent films that that you made. Do you have? And like I said, you don't gotta you don't gotta reveal anything sure, yet. Sure. But is there being something? Is there something being worked on at the moment? As a filmmaker, yes. There's a few things I'm uh, developing. You know, several features. Um, I may even do a short this year that I'm thinking about. But. Um, but yeah, I'm developing several features, one with uh, two very talented director, producers, uh, writers that are a husband and wife team. And we've been working on a film that we hope to get made sometime this year or next. Um, and it's a sci-fi film and it's really, really cool. It's won tons of awards at festivals. Uh, it was written by by uh, Courtney Spasato, or sorry, Mark Spasato and Courtney Spasato is his wife. And uh, they're just really talented. I did a short film with them recently. Um, and I really hope we get that film made because that, that film um, could be really special. It could be like a really big indie hit, I think. I don't know. It's, it's really unique. So that's one. And then um, I have a few others that I'm working on um, with different people and then one for myself. So we'll see what gets made. I, I, I always hesitate to like say what I'm working on because you have to get the money. You have to get the team attached and who knows what's going to hit next so of course but there are a few things on the table i would say i have about five things i'm working on right now um a question that i was gonna that i'm going to ask you now uh is what is like the biggest struggle for you as an independent filmmaker because i know there could be a couple of things just to get your feet off the ground in a sense to get something like this started as far as i mean i feel like producing is one of the biggest things for a film for sure you know mm-hmm. but i'll let you speak on that what what was what would you say out of the two films that you've already made what was like a couple of the biggest struggles that you had making the films well the hardest thing for any indie filmmaker i think is is usually raising the money and that's that's still the hardest but if you take that out of the equation because everyone struggles with that um i think it's it's just sort of 
get preparation is is what is what i've learned the most is like if you're not prepared so many things can go wrong sure preparation and then the team that you build so it's kind of like how i envision casting a movie you know you can try to be an acting coach on set as a director or you can hire the right actor and you can really wait till you find the right actor and you can you know maybe it's really fast maybe it takes a long time but you really should be picky with both your crew and your cast Mm -hmm. and i think that's part of the preparation it's like if you pick the right people to work with people that are easy to work with people that are talented people that are you know open-minded and and and, you know collaborative then it's just gonna be a great great fit you know um but you'll see a lot lot of people have reputations for not being easy to work with and then you'll see their careers struggle as, as actors or or even filmmakers because people don't want to work with people that are hard to work with you know so i feel like i always try to be an easy person to work with collaborative and um and always focus on the goal of just making the best project possible absolutely to summarize it's like just be a good person (laughs) yeah i mean it gets complicated in hollywood because like you know there's egos and there's things that go on but you know i won't i won't say any details but basically you see it all the time and uh and it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot right right Absolutely. And and not realizing it until you do realize it later right. on. Right? Yeah, until it's too late. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there was actually a short film that, that you might have just brought up before, but yeah. it was called, is it I've Been Compromised? That's right, yep. That's the one you were just talking about uh, before? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I watched that, I believe on Vimeo. On yeah. Vimeo it was on. That's right. Um, and I thought it was very different for you, man. Yeah. It was completely different for you. It like, was. From what I've seen you in beforehand, I was right. like, wow, all right, this is interesting. Yeah. And not only your character was interesting, but the whole concept of it, the whole mystery of it, you don't really know what's going on. What is he running from? Who is he running from? Right. It was very interesting. So what what led you towards that role? And did you go a different way of acting than you usually have had for this sort of thing? Yeah. So uh, I loved the role. I loved the project. Basically, Courtney had worked on Listen to Your Heart, actually. So she reached out to me with this and, and offered me this role. And so I, I read the script. And, you know, to be honest, I don't do short films. I usually don't do many. And, and this sort of inspired me to get back into it because, wow, short short film can be great. And it's fast. And it's, it's like you get to play a different character. So... It was really fun for me um and they're just really talented so very easy to work with talk about people that are easy to work with and talented and and i think are going to go far you know so that was great in terms of acting like different than i normally would i just i always just try to feel like what's going to be the best thing for the each project so um it was different for me which is why i wanted to do it you know also but it was also uh, really something I would love watching. I do love watching it. You know, uh, I, I, I want to do movies that I would like to watch as an audience member, too. Sure. And, and I was a big fan of that sort of storytelling. So I thought it was really unique and I liked it. I've been compromised. Definitely check it out. It's it's like a twist ending, if if you would say. Yeah, uh, for, for sure. sure. For sure. Um, and uh, it was very interesting. So I wanted to bring that up because mm-hmm. I remember... Right when it came out, uh, Grandma Kathy was over and we all watched it together. Oh, cool. And we yeah. were like, what did you think? I was like, you know what? That was really it, – it was interesting. It was yeah. very interesting and surprising, yeah. obviously, to, yeah, towards yeah. the end of it. Totally. So uh, you all did a great job on that. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you just finished filming a Hallmark movie. Right. Um, and I have the name of it, Redemption in Cherry Hill. Cherry Springs. Cherry, Cherry Springs. Yes, yep, Cherry Springs. Right. Yep. Sorry. Um so how was the filming with that? What kind of character are you playing? Uh, and you could tell us the release date for it because it got announced. Yeah, it comes out September 12th. So check it out. Uh, it's actually really cool. It's a, it's a murder mystery. I feel like <laughs> some of us were, were joking on set. It's kind of like murder she wrote for a younger generation. Like it, it, It's like younger cast, uh, very sort of fun and, and, and cool um, storytelling. And so I think, look, I, I had a lot of fun filming it. The, the cast and crew were a dream to work with. Um, the, the the casting is really cool. It's like a very diverse cast, and I, I love to see that on screen and the crew as well. Um, yeah, it was just it was just a lot of fun, and, and probably one of the bigger budget things I've done. Actually, it was really there were a lot of cool toys we played with on set, jibs and cranes and things. And oh um, yeah, 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 and and you know really cool cars i mean it was fun i play a detective oh nice so i'm uh not the lead detective there's a guy i I sort of work with so i'm like the sidekick detective and he's really great his name's keith robinson 
Okay. And you've probably seen him in uh, Dreamgirls. He was in, and he's been in a lot of uh, you know a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, yeah, and then Frankie Faison is in it, and he was great to work with. Uh, you know, I'm from Coming to America, probably and other. Oh, things. okay, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, it was a great. The whole cast and crew were great. How many? How long were you filming this? Oh man, I was filming probably 15 or 16 days out of like a 20 it was a quick shoot like 20 days but i was there almost every day yeah it was, okay yeah gotcha uh very nice so do you see this thing as being uh like maybe like a limited series sort of deal because a detective mystery like yeah. murder mystery sort of deal sounds like something it would become like something bigger than it is right let's hope i mean i don't know I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna be really cool, and uh, we'll see what what Hallmark does with it. But I I really hope people like it. Now I don't really watch the Hallmark Channel that much, but is this something different than than what they usually do as far as like I murder think, mysteries? Well, they have a, a murder mystery sort of division. I think like I, I don't even know if there's a channel like that. But uh, so there's the Hallmark Channel, and then there's I think something like murder mysteries as well. That's like a different uh, either channel or segment of the channel. Yeah. And I think it's going to be part of that. Um, but, you know, they're sort of more known for romantic stuff, but definitely also known for the murder mystery okay. genre. Yeah. Very cool. Excited to see that. Uh, yeah. I can't wait. Is a trailer already out for it or, or not no, yet? No, not yet. Not no. yet. Okay. I'll be, I'll be keeping my eye out for yeah. that. We'll see. I mean, we'll see if I make it in the trailer. But uh, a lot of other talented actors that were, were really good in it. And I think, I think everyone did a great job, actually. Awesome. That's always good to hear. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, the last thing that I wanted to to talk to you about was yeah. you and Katrina's business that you have. Sure. Which I think is a beautiful thing. It's the voice and acting studios. Acting and voice. Acting yeah. and voice studios. Sorry about no, that. No, no worries. And uh, you're you're based in a couple of locations uh, in New York and Connecticut, I believe, right? And other places as well? Yeah. So we started in Connecticut, but then we are now in New York. And then we moved online during the pandemic, which we're, where we mainly still are. Um, but we do things in New York, L.A., Atlanta, and then the classes are worldwide. I mean, we do things in London. So it's, it's really gone pretty big. Yeah. Uh, all, all online, though, you're, right? Uh, so we do acting reels and some in-person classes in Atlanta, L.A., and New York. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice, nice. But other than that, everything else is online. Yeah. Very nice. Now, what does what does the studio have to offer? I, I, I did go on the website, and I yeah. saw it was acting classes, but you're also talking about uh, agencies <coughs> looking, like, you know, professional agencies, like, looking for actors and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, what is the voice factor of it as well? Sure. So just want to clarify that all the classes are for educational purposes, So, but they are taught by agents, casting directors, and managers. So... The great thing about it is like these are the people that are and we and we get people that are working on like the biggest stuff right now you know like all the biggest shows movies etc that they have worked on and, or are working on right and the reason we do that is because they are providing this great education for people um actors that want to know what is it like when you get an audition what is it like when you are preparing for a role when you book a role when you are getting direction you know they, they even do scene studies so some other studios do like more short form like sort of workshops mm -hmm. and our, our differentiator is that we do sometimes four weeks sometimes longer you know we're really having the cast directors agents and managers digging into the work with the actors and and sort of helping train them to work professionally in, in the in, in entertainment industry I love that so you know there I see the difference as being is like all right I'm gonna go to this audition they might not even give you information of what you're supposed to act like or who you're supposed to be playing as, but say you do, you would be preparing that way. But once you get into the audition room, it could just feel like a totally different thing, right? So like you're what you're saying is that people, these coaches and whatnot, are preparing these actors for the audition uh, necessarily. Partly, yeah, that's definitely one of the things we do is we prepare people with audition technique mm -hmm. and, and sort of how to break down a script right away within minutes. And, and then still deliver a good audition. How to, if you have longer time than that, how to dig deeper into the character, how to dig deeper into the history. We teach things like the moment before, all, all these different things, you know, that, that are sort of basic and then some more advanced acting techniques uh, with scene study and everything. So we, we do kind of a little bit of everything. Um, we want to be like the one-stop shop where an actor can come f as a beginner or an advanced actor and then, you know, help them with their, their career and their craft throughout their career kind of thing right 
so like we even do headshots now and, and acting reels and you know everything you need as an actor basically awesome literally yeah. one-stop shop sort of yeah deal. that's that's fantastic yeah uh so when did you when was this founded Katrina founded this um, about four years ago, and it started really small. It started in our basement, honestly. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, she was just teaching acting classes and voice lessons, and then you know we opened up a place in town when that started growing, and then after Connecticut, we opened up in New York, and then New York really took off, and then the pandemic hit, and then we went online, and then it really sort of exploded because mm. we were able to reach all these people around the world, and we'd wanted to go online for a while all these people around the world that uh, that were interested in having access to, you know, act uh, agents, cast directors and managers um, to learn from them and, and, and can't unless you're in New York and L.A. Well, now you could from Australia or England or Japan. Even right. we have people from all over the world. So it's amazing. It's been really great. Yeah. Really rewarding. So like you said, you wanted to get into online, but the pandemic kind of forced you to go online. You, you're yeah. probably happy uh, in that sense, right? Oh, yeah. I mean obviously not happy for the pandemic but course, happy right. for making uh, something good out of something bad yeah uh it was great i mean we had wanted to go online but it was intimidating because we're like are people going to want to learn online and we were really not sure about that mm -hmm. and now everybody had to so everyone's sort of used to it um i think there's getting in general some like zoom fatigue people are getting a little bit fatigued of being on zoom all the time and and that kind of learning so we have seen a little bit of a spike in people wanting to come back in in person which we still do but uh but i frankly think the online classes are just awesome because you can take them from anywhere you know you can be anywhere and and we can get coaches from anywhere so you can learn from the best of the best and not be anywhere near you know where they live so it, it's really cool absolutely awesome um yeah, that's that's great, man. I love Thanks. the fact that you're helping these actors grow. Uh, voice actors, I'm assuming too, grow. And yeah, I should mention that too. So yeah, we uh, the voice part is mainly voiceover. So we have a voiceover booth. We do voiceover reels for people, and uh, we have voiceover casting directors, agents, and managers. So we have we have coaches specific to every sort of part of acting tv sitcom uh features soap operas theater mm. um uh youth classes beginner classes scene study meisner so literally everything you could imagine um we're teaching there and then voiceover has become pretty big because not that many studios teach it and during the pandemic sort of taught us all as actors um voiceover can be a really great thing to do it's very can be very lucrative and very uh very good, especially when people aren't seeing you in person. You get a voiceover set up, you know, like you have here, for example. Right. And uh, and you can you can still work. You can still do some good acting. So. Absolutely. Um, I love it, man. I really do. Thank uh, you, man. Congrats on it. I love that it blew up too. That yeah. so many people are are coming in to to try this out and everything like that. Yeah, I mean, I we're just fantastic. happy to help to help people, and I, I I just love seeing all the success stories come through our our, our door. Um, just knows you know it makes you feel like you're helping people so it's great oh absolutely and i i'm one of those people that thinks that uh by helping others you're also helping yourself in a sense as well oh absolutely yeah, yeah. definitely um all right man that's that's all i really had for you yeah. ken i want to thank you so much for doing this for me of I course really dude. Appreciate you had great it. great questions this is a lot of fun yeah man thank you yeah. i you know i i've been doing these spotlight interviews here and there and whatnot i was like all right Ken's in the back of my mind, but I kind of want to get some Pratt's in first <laughs> before I get him and Katrina on here. So I'm glad we finally uh, made this happen. No, this is great. And uh, before we end, uh, if you want to plug in where they could find you on social media and everything like that. Sure. You're yeah. To. Yeah. It's uh, just my name on everything I think now. So on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and YouTube, it's just Kent Moran. And then challengers on showtime right now and the hallmark movie uh, redemption in cherry springs comes out september 12th so check that out awesome you heard the man so make sure you check all that stuff out it's also going to be in my description uh right below the video um so with all that being said if you like this episode make sure to like subscribe and share also follow follow us on instagram at podcast with frank i'll be posting clips of this podcast among other projects i'm working on for you to check out we're also on Facebook and Twitter at Ferenc Videos. And we are on TikTok as well at Ferenc Videos. So Boom. make sure you check us out there as well. With all that being said, we hope you have a wonderful night and peace out. Love this guy. His name is Jeff Wittick. Have you ever heard of him before? I rings the bell. I never watch his videos. Okay. So this guy, Jeff Wittick, 
a part of the vlog squad, David Dobrik's vlog squad, and I'll get into David in a minute, but Jeff Wittick has a great show on his channel that he used to do, I believe it's coming back, but it's called Jeff's Barbershop. You know the Eric Andre show? The Eric Andre show, yes. Yeah. Think of the Eric Andre show, but in a barbershop, and crazy shit is happening while their guest is getting a haircut. But he puts his own spin to it. He does it very well. And it I'm telling you, dude, it's one of the funniest, funniest YouTube series out there, in my opinion, is this show, Jeff's Barbershop. He has a podcast now called Jeff FM, um, which is also great. It's hilarious.